This is the Comics Alternative, episode 224. Reviews of Beowulf, Canopy, and Shadows on the Grave. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this week's episode, Andy and I are going to be looking at three very different titles. We're going to begin with a comics adaptation of Beowulf by Santiago Garcia and David Rubin. After that, we're going to discuss Kareen Benadou's Canopy. And then we're going to wrap up with the first two issues of Shadows on the Grave by Richard Corbin. But before we get into that discussion, we want to let all of you listening know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, image and dark horse titles at 40 percent off of the cover price if you pre-order for all of the other publishers you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35 percent off of the cover price and every single month you're going to find some unbelievable specials sometimes this those specials could be 45 percent off of the cover price sometimes as much as 50 percent off cover but you know every now and again you can find discounts that go higher than that that's right, and since this month we're talking about, or this this episode we're talking about the Beowulf graphic novel from Image Comics, you can find that at 40% off on DCB service right now, and the latest issue of Richard Corbin's Shadows on the Grave, number three, is also available for 40% off, so if you like what you hear about, uh, about these comics today, you can check out uh, some of them at Discount Comic Book Service. That's right. It's a great place to get your comics, those of which we discuss on this show, but then many, many others as well. That's DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, here we are uh, toward the very end of January. Hard to believe that we're already almost a month into the year. I hope your semester has started off okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's been pretty good as far as being a um, an administrator. It does feel like a lot of fires have to get put out in that uh, the week leading up to the semester and in the first couple weeks of classes. As students are begging to get in the classes that are full and i don't know copiers are going out <laughs> we, need, we have all these all these little crises to deal with so that's been mm. my last few weeks uh, do you run a tight ship no what what's the, what's the opposite <laughs> of a tight ship a loose ship a sinking ship <laughs> a sinking ship yeah i run a sinking ship but it's a slow leak uh, yeah yeah i haven't had those kind of fires going on yet i've had students ask me to get into my own classes that are closed uh -huh. and you know i'm i'm kind of an easy to a mm -hmm. point uh there if they demonstrate to me that they're not a complete dolt mm -hmm. and then they'll do the work <laughs> i'll let them in yeah but uh yeah so it's going to be uh a, a good semester i'm looking forward to it yeah Well, let's get into this week's discussion, which both of us are looking forward to. And we're going to begin with Beowulf. This is a adaptation of the classic Old English poem uh, adapted by Santiago Garcia and David Rubin. And this is coming out from Image Comics. That's right. So where do we want to start with this? Do we want to start with Beowulf? This book as an uh, adapted uh, 
exercise? Do we want to start mm-hmm. with Beowulf as a comic all on its own? Do we want to talk about the creators themselves who are rather colorful, so to speak, <laughs> uh, in terms of the work that they've done previously? Well, this um – you know, I th- one of the reasons why I was interested in covering this for the podcast is because, uh, you know, as someone who teaches the British Lit Survey, I teach Beowulf pretty regularly. Um, and this isn't the first uh, comics adaptation of this epic poem, but um, it, it's the latest and I think uh, maybe, in my mind, the best of, of the ones mm-hmm. we've seen so far. And... Um, and it it does a lot of things that I really feel like highlight some of the areas of Beowulf that I talk about in my teaching. So I'm I'm really happy for that in particular. Now, have have you taught Beowulf before? Uh, I have not taught. I think I've taught sections of it mm-hmm. maybe once when I was teaching a world lit class. Yeah, because that was my question to you. What has been your experience with Beowulf, not only as a professor but also as a student? And I have to say that throughout my education, high school, undergrad, graduate school, I was able to avoid and not intentionally, but just not take those kind of classes where I had to read Beowulf. So as a student, I never read Beowulf. Hmm. Now, when I first started teaching, there was an occasion where I taught a world literature course where uh, an excerpt from Beowulf was a part of it. But that's been so long ago, I can't even remember the experience of teaching it. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, you know it's it's funny because whenever I bring up um Beowulf especially kind of talking about the heroic tradition when I'm dealing with superhero comics even uh mm-hmm. you know I'll ask my students did you read Beowulf in high school and they all groan yeah <laughs> and um, I'm I'm always kind of curious about that reaction because uh I've all, I you know Beowulf's a pretty action packed story um, on its on its own. Now it depends, I guess, on which translation they're reading too. When they're in high school, if they're reading the, you know, the great Seamus Haney translation, which actually came out, I think, after I was a high school student, so I right. didn't get to benefit from that until until college. Uh, but um, it does it does feel like this particular graphic novel is, you know, at least in spirit. Um, doing what Haney was trying to do with that with that uh, um, uh, translation, which was to really kind of really emphasize the violence and the blood and the guts that that go on in that poem, rather than kind of making it sound like this you know, lofty poetic work that a lot of uh, other translators have imbued in it. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned a little while ago other comics adaptations of Beowulf, and, you know, I guess I should have looked that up before we started to record today, but but what other ones were, did you have in mind? Well, I mean, there's the the 1970s DC series that I I do show in class, which isn't really a very faithful adaptation, but it does deal with some of the the elements, elements of um of the um of the original and then um let's see what else there's um there's the one that uh what Gareth Hines did a few years ago um that one is actually pretty good that that's close to 10 years old now um and now there's a few others that I'm I'm drawing a blank on. I think there's was a, there classics illustrated? I that that I don't know. There's been um like there's been a science fiction version. Mm-hmm. I know that. Um, so, um, I'm trying to remember the others. I I should I should ch- check to see if there is a classics illustrated. Um, you'd think there would be. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know if I've ever seen it. Um. Yeah, I guess. Um, there's, I think, a more recent Classics Illustrated, maybe. Um, mm. I'm not sure. 
Huh. Okay. No, because you, you had said that of the ones that you're familiar with, this mm. is probably the best. It's the one that really stood mm-hmm. out. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's basically from, you know, the Ger- the Gareth Hines one, which I do think is actually still pretty good. And, you know, the, the DC series, which... I don't know how I don't know how much that counts. Oh yeah, and then there's the uh there's the first comics one that um shoot, what's his name? Now I'm now I feel bad that I'm I'm drawing <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on this. The art it's the artist who did um uh, Jerry Bingham. I'm looking at my shelf. <laughs> no, okay. I just flipped around to look at my shelf. Jerry Bingham uh did one for first comics in their kind of album format. That also is um it has some good action in it. Bingham is a good kind of classic action artist. So, um, so there's that one as well. So it's, it's not like there are a load of terrible adaptations of Beowulf out there in comics form, but, um, you know, this one really stood out to me as really capturing, like I said before, capturing the things I really like to emphasize in uh, my discussions of Beowulf with my students. Yeah, you know, you you emphasized the action and the violence mm-hmm. in this Beowulf, and that's one of the things that struck me, uh, specifically Rubin's artwork and the way that he depicts action, um, specifically during fight scenes, but not just limited mm-hmm. to, to fight scenes. Um, you know, you referenced earlier the appreciation with your students, at least, uh, for Beowulf in light of discussions of, the, say, the you know, superhero comics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the action in this Beowulf reminded me not so much of the kind of action we see illustrated in, you know, traditional superhero comics. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 there is that there, but I was reminded more of the kind or the, the ways that action and fighting in particular is represented in manga. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Because, because the, the way that uh, action seems to be represented in, in a lot of manga, not, not all of it. Um, I mean, obviously, there is the representation of movement, but sometimes that movement is drawn in such a way that the physical events themselves, the very actions, the kicking, the hitting, the jumping and whatnot, becomes almost literally a blur to where you're going through some of the panels and you're not exactly sure what's going on, but you know something is going on, and that's intentional. And I got the feel of that in in Beowulf. And that's a little different from superhero violence in mm-hmm. that during fights, you can more I mean you see the movement, you, you but you know more or less know what's going on, right? So you know that someone is kicking someone or that someone is being hurled back uh because of a blow they've received. Um in manga many times at least with my experience in the manga that I've read, sometimes it's unclear, but I think that's part of the message. And I felt that way reading Beowulf. Hmm. You know, one of the things, since we're talking about the way action is depicted in this book, one of the things that I think really stood out to me about uh, Rabin's art here is his use of double page spreads and mm-hmm. and really inventive layouts as far as the way the way he does those spreads. Now they're not they're not always used to depict action, but very often the action takes place in those in those sorts of um, uh, arrangements. And uh, in a large part, those, uh, you know, he'll, he'll do things like he will have uh, multiple, he'll have, he'll have movement within a single panel mm-hmm. where, you know, like Grendel rushes into the, to uh, Herat and, um, and we see him go through, uh, go through the hall over the course of two pages, and meanwhile, there's these um, uh, odd uses of 3D type um, panels, I guess, where they're not they're not um, I don't know how, how to how to describe them. They're at odd angles, so that it looks like we're seeing basically the way Gre- Grendel is seeing as he scans through the hall. And um, anyway, so there, there's a lot of these inventive uh double page spreads that I really I really liked. Now when when we got our review copies of this we got a PDF. And right. unfortunately those double page spreads aren't 
formatted as a single two page unit, right? So so we'd have to scroll through from one to the other. And even when I tried to look at at it in the side by side page format, the pages didn't line up to that so that the double page spreads were both on the screen at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's great that we do get digital copies and access mm. to their review folder from, from image. Um, but this is one of those instances where the downside of reading the digital is rather limiting. I didn't even switch my tablet reader to the two page view um, because I didn't want to hold my reader in a particular way. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I looked at it just page by page. And you're right. I, I I got a sense of what was going on, but I feel that it's very different than the experience I would have had in reading the book. Now, I actually did order or pre-order the book through Discount Comic Book Service, our mm. sponsor. D- did you get it? No, I didn't. And I really want to go out, actually go out and get this this book as a physical book because I think – um you know, I liked it a lot, and I think that the reading experience is even going to be better in reading it as as a print book and kind of absorbing these really innovative and um, interesting layouts that that Rabin chooses for his uh, for his pages. Right. Yeah. Now I said I pre-ordered it. I don't have that hard copy yet. Uh-huh. Um, that's why I'm reading from a digital, mm-hmm. but uh, I'll eventually get it. So 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 that's good. Um, yeah, I do think that this is something that I could much better appreciate, and perhaps our listeners as well, uh, in in hard copy form. Getting back to to Rubin's art and what you were suggesting, I mean, I, I, to me that that's the standout of mm-hmm. this adaptation is Rubin's art. I mean, I I really enjoy his en- enjoyed his art before. You know, we've discussed him on the show in the past. Uh I guess first where we were looking at the Aurora West books in the the Battling Boy series. Right. Um and we haven't reviewed either of those, but we've mentioned this on our previous <coughs> show that uh Rubin has done uh, the Hero series those two books. Um, Ether, we haven't discussed that, but we've mentioned it in the past. Uh, he also did a, a series last year, The Fiction from Boom. Um, and, but I know that Edward and I discussed some of his work a few months ago. He was in uh, one of the creators in the anthology that actually uh, Gar- uh, Santiago Garcia uh, edited, Spanish Fever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he he's quite prominent, I think, to to American or English language readers, uh, if they know where to look. The thing I really love about his art are these action scenes Mm -hmm. and not necessarily the physical action of the fight, but sometimes uh, even maybe more. So I appreciate what he does with more subtle action. Now I don't have a page number here, but Mm -hmm. I'm looking around page 23 of the PDF. And this is right when Beowulf and his crew arrive uh, to uh, to the Danes, and they're getting off their their ship. They're unloading, and we have a full page here where, and this is the one where the the soldiers, the Danish soldiers, address him. Who dares? Mm-hmm. Now, the background image, the uh, illustration that takes up all of the page, is. It's kind of it, 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 it does represent some movement, but it's a still image of people, Beowulf and others, getting off the boat and unloading. But it's those inset panels, mm-hmm. those smaller inset panels, many of which overlap one over the other, where you see little actions like someone like Beowulf himself throwing off his cape, uh, someone knocking up someone else's head to wake him up, the rope getting untied or ropes actually getting tied, the snorting of the horses, those little things. Sometimes they're close ups. Sometimes they pull back a little more, but it's it's Rabin's representation of those little actions mm-hmm. within the larger full page that does give an animated feel to to what's going on here. And he does this throughout. He does it with the fight scenes. He does this with other scenes to represent action, even though something dramatic is not going on. And and I absolutely love that. And that's what, for me, made this book cinematic in scope. Not necessarily the fact that things were represented over a two-page spread, where you had kind of like the, the, the fuller mm-hmm. screen, but the way that action seems to 
emanate from these still images. Yeah, I think I think that what one of the words that came to my mind as I was reading that this book was animated. You know that it does feel like you 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 can uh, that Rubin has a really great sense of movement uh, of action within a panel and from from panel to panel. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the, his use of inset panels. Um, one of the most effective ways I feel like I, I saw of, of him using this, and this is something that's that's I think you know uh, you, you know you talked about kind of cinematic. Uh, the example I was thinking of is more is closer to you know is or something that can only be done in comics, which is very early in the book when uh, we get these pages in which um, we're seeing the carnage. Of of Grendel's first attack on Herod, uh, but inset within those larger vertical panels of uh, of the carnage are smaller panels that show um, the moments immediately before the attack when mm-hmm. um, when the the celebrations were going on. Uh, you know, Rothgar is is having a feast, uh, but the way those inset panels are actually integrated with the um the scene of the um of the carnage uh is is really fascinating it isn't just that these are inset panels but in many cases they overlay like a character we'll see a character's body in the present but their head in the past right uh, and that and that is a really amazing approach to time in in comics but it also so it's not just that it is you know kind of flashy and and creative on its own but it really drives home the impact of what life is like for the danes before grendel shows up and then after grendel shows up and then we jump ahead 12 years and we realize that this these attacks go on for that entire time yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because we were talking about the dynamism of mm-hmm. the art, and it's not just spatial dynamics; that's temporal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I think this this book would be really teachable as both, you know, an adaptation of Beowulf. So if I were dealing with the kind of literary adaptations in the comics, but also just as a comic, uh, what Rubin does is. Um, so effective and emphasizes so well the um the qualities that you can do you can do in a comic that you can't do in other media And he is, as we've been discussing, very inventive, Rubin, in the way that he depicts action, much more sophisticated than you would find in, let's say, your typical action or superhero comic. At the same time, Rubin has a strong background and what I'm assuming a love of you know, mm-hmm. traditional superhero comics. And he's not afraid to play around with the various superhero tropes that we're all used to and i'm thinking in particular of not not just some of the action scenes that we get um where where fighting is taking place but again i'm looking at the pdf page numbers Mm -hmm. around uh 53 this is during the uh, fight scene with grendel and we have on this page images of the fight but dividing the two images there is at a slant the word slash Mm -hmm. And each one of it with two exclamation marks afterwards, and each one of those words and the exclamation marks are also panels that represent action as well. But the fact that he wrote out the word smash in this, mm-hmm. I think, you know, quite ambitiously experimental in many ways visually um, graphic novel, it, 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 I find curious because here is something that you would find in a typical superhero comic and he's not afraid to, to use those strategies to represent action as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, and I think all of this works, it works well too in service of 
of the story. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things I really appreciate about this adaptation is how it emphasizes certain things that I talk about when I teach this poem in class. And and some of that stuff includes, you know, the question of why why does Beowulf undertake this mission to fight Grendel? He has no no real kind of political stake in it. Uh, it's not his people that are being attacked. And what um, what Garcia and Rubin really do drive home is that Beowulf is doing this for um, for his basically his reputation, his legend. He right. is he is making him he is he is making himself um, a legend who is going to be um, talked about and sung about in um, throughout the rest of history, and. Um, and that's that's driven home by several things. I mean, one of one of the scenes I'm really glad they include is the scene in which Beowulf, uh, you know, in the in the in the feast before he takes on Grendel, he is um, he is uh, kind of what, uh, dissed by um, another warrior named is it Hylak? Uh, this is the younger one, warrior. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I think it's it's Hylak. I I get a lot of these na- a lot of these names are hard for me to follow. But anyway, that uh, you know that um, I you know I basically I heard that um, you know that you were uh, no, it's Unferth. That's it, Unferth. Unferth. Yeah. yeah. I, I heard that you were um, you know you, that you actually lost this swimming race. Um, against Eggla or against somebody else, I can't remember. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and um, and Beowulf has to defend himself against this attack, this attack on his reputation. But what's what's interest, what I find really interesting about that is that he brings that or San- that Garcia and Rubin bring this back multiple times in the. Um, in the course of the book. Whereas in the poem, I think this only happens, you know, we only get this, this interaction, this one time. Um, it, uh, it comes back again later. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I it know it adds depth to the motivation, right? Right. It adds, it adds depth to the motivation, but it also shows, you know, that Beowulf's extraordinary concern for his reputation that, uh, when he's challenged like this about you know a loss that he has in a swimming race, he has to explain. Well, it wasn't really a loss because um, you know I slaughtered all of these sea creatures while I was while I was in the swimming race, and now the seas are safer for everybody else. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and so Beowulf's success as a warrior is is largely based on this desire to. Uh, to have this reputation and and uh, and build his legend, but then what Garcia and uh, and Rubin also deal with is is what happens later. What happens when Beowulf becomes a king, uh, and how effective is he as a politician who um, who is primarily concerned with his legend and and reputation. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, th- that's one of the things I enjoyed about this is the fact that we do get a sense of why Beowulf is doing what he's doing. You know, at one point, the king does ask him, you know, you're not doing this for political reasons. You're not doing this uh, for really mo- anything monetarily linked uh, to your actions. So why are you doing it? And, you know, he basically says, you know, politics, they eventually fade. Power fades. Uh, money runs out. But with fame, with glory, you know, you live on. It, it's the one thing that lives on after you're dead. And so basically, this is his way of getting eternal life in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this becomes clear. So, and we get a couple of times in this book 
um, I guess, a bard who either sings mm-hmm. to him or sings about him. But that one scene that you mentioned, and this comes right before, this is after the battle with Grendel, but before the one with his mother, when he's talking to, uh, who is it, Unferth yeah. about, about this race. And it's almost as if Beowulf becomes his own bard, right? Mm-hmm. So instead of, or before others begin to sing his praises and tell his story, he does it himself. He doesn't do it through song, but he does, in essence, the same thing. And so you can tell through through this story that you highlighted, uh, this, this swimming mm-hmm. race, him killing the monsters, making the sea safe for, for others, that this is what he's in it for. Mm-hmm. He's in it for the fame. He's in it for his, his name to, to stand the test of time. Right, right. And so that... That scene that you mentioned has additional resonance later on in the in the third section, where uh, Bale will fight. You know, he's become a king. Uh, he's he's aged quite a bit, and a dragon comes out and um, starts laying waste to his his kingdom. Mm-hmm. And um, and is the in the and we see this kind of this really really weary version of Beowulf as as an older man he's won you know he's he's defeated uh what is it the the Norwegians um or the Swedes I can't the Swedes yeah yeah yeah. so um so as as a king he's he's defeated the Swedes after they uh after they murdered Herdred who was the original um heir to the the crown of the Danes and um and so all of his all of his battles have been have been won uh so uh Rubin depicts him as this this older and and appears to be very weary um you know former hero who now gets one last adventure and as he has his feast right before uh, going out after the dragon the the bard wants to sing his um his song about Beowulf's current, you know, mission and Beowulf stops him and said, no, and you know, don't, um, don't do that. Um, um, until the story's over, you know, don't, I don't want to hear this until the story's over. But then he also mentions, um, he says on, and this is on page one fifty one of the version we have, uh, says, would you like to to know the true story of Brecca? And Brecca is the um, is the warrior that Beowulf had the swimming race against that that he allegedly lost, but has his reasons for that. And and right. so this shows, and I don't think that that actually happens in the poem itself. So this shows that he is he is you know of all of his great victories he's had in his life, he is obsessed with this one defeat he had and you know and he says and what of brecca will his story be sung as beowulf's or will brecca be forgotten by the whole world and so the one person who's ever bested beowulf up until this point is still this obsession for him and yet his um, attempt at consolation with that is that well people are going to be singing about me they won't be singing about him and yet and yet, Breck is a part of Beowulf's story. We don't. We are. We are still hearing about him, right? Uh, and so that's, I think, one of the things that they they really capture the complexity. I think a lot of a lot of the versions of Beowulf that we see, whether it's the film adaptations, uh, film adaptation that um, Neil Gaiman and Roger Avery wrote, um, or or other comics, is that they they kind of emphasize primarily emphasize the action of the story, the heroic nature of defeating these monsters that are plaguing uh, the people. And this book really gets at the complexity of Beowulf's character and the depth. Right. And complicates that yeah. in certain ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that scene that you mentioned where uh, he is mentioning the, the true story of, of Brecca right after that, we get this what I'm assuming is a two page spread of Beowulf preparing for battle mm-hmm. with the dragon. 
And, you know, you, you mentioned that he is an older, a more weary warrior. Uh, and he's also one who's not in the same kind of shape yeah. he was when he was younger. And we get this, uh, again, what I assume is a two-page spread of him putting on the armor, preparing himself, and it, at times struggling to put on mm. the shirt or the belt because it just doesn't fit anymore. And And in this way... It just reminded me of um, the, you know, the the animated film, The Incredibles. Yeah, <laughs> and well, yeah, and you know, and The Incredibles in many ways is similar here, right? Because you have an older warrior who is getting back into the tights to do what he did in uh, in, in ways that are reminiscent of his glory days. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so showing the human side of of, of Beowulf here again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things I, I like to emphasize when when I teach it too is that um, you know Beowulf proves to be a great warrior, but when it when it comes to being a politician or comes to be a person who delegates authority, he's not very good at that, um, and and so. The um, Garcia and Rubin highlight that too at the end with these these conversations and debates between Beowulf and Wiglaf, who Wiglaf who becomes basically the successor to Beowulf. But Beowulf has has kind of left his his nation in a really bad position, um, and so you know he uh, he's primarily the reason why. Um, the Swedes haven't tried to attack again uh, because he so sorely defeated them, but also because he did that relatively single-handedly, his men have become kind of complacent about their lives. And now it's Wiglaf's job once, spoiler alert, Beowulf dies when he's good, fights a <laughs> dragon. Uh, I think I think after uh, however, you know, thousand plus years of the story. We don't need to have a spoiler alert. Uh, and, and Wiglaf gives this big speech to them saying, you know, you, you, you've basically shamed your king and the Swedes are going to come in and they're going to wipe us out because you are so have become so complacent and you didn't, and you didn't assist your king in the, in, in fighting this dragon, you bailed on him. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, and I thought that was, you know, again, that happens in the poem, but I thought that was a really effective, way of showing what you know Wiglaf becomes the type of warrior that um um that the geats need uh in their post beowulf world mm. okay so we're talking about the end of, of beowulf now but mm. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the very end of this book yeah. which is not the end of Beowulf mm-hmm. proper, but it's the end of Beowulf, this particular version, right. uh, this edition. Um, and I don't think that if we talk about this, this would be a spoiler right. because it doesn't give away anything dealing with the narrative. Mm-hmm. But what Garcia and Rubin do is they take a very metafictional mm-hmm. turn in the final pages because, you know, after that brief speech by Wiglaf where he basically tells everyone that they were not there with Beowulf, that this will come back to haunt them, uh, that they're going to be easy prey now when when the Swedes return. And then we get this sending forth of the body of Beowulf. And the the comic, in its own way, does it fade to black. Mm-hmm. And then as the lights, so to speak, are fading back up, we find a series of panels that are text first you know the the uh the original poem then we get a translation then we get uh i i'm assuming in spanish uh what looks to be correspondences uh from garcia to rubin and then rubin's illustrations the draft the finished the layout the actual book and by the time we get to the end of the these several pages here, the actual product itself, the book Beowulf, the one that you're supposedly, you know, holding in your hand right there, a representation of that fills the final panels. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm wondering what you thought of this uh, self-referential turn. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant, and that's kind of where I was heading towards with this this emphasis on Beowulf's um, obsession with his own legend and glory and fame and so on. That those those final three or so pages are the payoff of that, right? He's mm-hmm. he survives in the original poem. He survives in English translations, and now he now his story survives as a graphic novel. And so that that um, he that you know that those three pages are the indication of Beowulf's ultimate success. Right. Yes. Yes. So that is the exclamation mark mm. at the very end of Beowulf. It's like Beowulf. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that about yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, we have Beowulf, uh, the old English poem. We have Beowulf, the film, you know, now read another Beowulf graphic novel. Next, we're going to have Beowulf, the uh, breakfast cereal. Yeah, I wonder what that would be like. And what it would taste like. (laughs) It would taste like uh, glory. (laughs) There you go. There's a tagline for the cereal. (laughs) Okay. So, but yeah, I I, I enjoyed this book. I didn't know if I would or not. Mm -hmm. And, And I think one of the reasons why you and I decided to discuss it this week, one, there was a logistical reason. We were looking for something that had just recently come out, and this was readily available. I didn't have my hard copy mm-hmm. yet, but we had access to yeah. a digital. Uh, but we also wanted to do this because, you know, we call ourselves two guys with PhDs talking about comics. We both come from an English professorial background. Yeah. What I mean, if we didn't discuss Beowulf, mm-hmm. Then we, you know, we wouldn't be worth our weight in anything. Yeah, and you know, I was hesitant at first because, and this is, I've I've looked up um, the the Wikipedia page here for Beowulf comics adaptations. That there was a time period about ten years ago, between two thousand five and two thousand seven, where four different Beowulf comics adaptations came out. Now, one of them was an adaptation of the film. Um, and so I think these were all kind of coinciding with Beowulf being in the zeitgeist at that moment, uh, because, especially mm-hmm. in the comics world, because um, Neil Gaiman had uh, co-written the screenplay for the movie, um, uh, which w- and it was also a big kind of CGI extravaganza. Um, and so it was getting a lot of attention at the time. And so when I saw this being advertised... Um, I guess there were five adaptations between 2005 and 2007. When I saw this being advertised, I thought, oh, my God, another Beowulf adaptation. We've already got a lot. Uh, but I think, you know, like I said earlier, this one this one does things that I, that I think are, I mean, part of it's Rubin's art that really sells it, but other other elements of it is just the way it pays off the, the key themes of uh, the original source in really interesting ways that function in comics and not and that that in ways that wouldn't be uh available in other media right and yeah and, and so the, no go ahead uh, and those final three pages are really again the payoff for that yeah yeah you know there's some adaptations in comics and then otherwise that I guess do somewhat of a service to the original, mm-hmm. but don't do anything other than reminding us of the original, but then there are other adaptations that actually make it live in a way it hadn't before, and I would say that this is of the latter category right yeah, definitely check out uh Santiago Garcia and David Rubin's Beowulf, which came out this month from Image Comics. Let's move on to the second title we're discussing, and this is Canopy. This is written and drawn by Kareen Bernadou, and it is from our friends at Retrofit Comics, Big Planet Comics. Mm-hmm. So we want to thank Jared and Box for keeping us in the know when it comes to their output. And, you know, th- this, see, this is one of the our favorite presses uh, on the Comics Alternative, Retrofit, Big Planet. Uh, and, and not just because Jared and Box, uh, you know, send us 
copies whenever new product comes out, but they do great work. Yeah, yeah. And um, and Canopy is a book that I, I found really fascinating. I went, I went through it a few times uh, when we got it, partially to kind of get everything straight with it, but also because as we should kind of emphasize right from the outset is that it is um, a silent or wordless comic. Um, there's some sound effects, but other than that, there's no dialogue, no caption boxes uh, throughout the book. Right, but even the sound effect... Well, yeah, okay, there are some words with the sound effect, because I'm looking at one where an insect um, pierces the head of the young girl in a fantasy scene where it's inflated, so it says pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so those words are few and far between. Right. And any time the dialogue is involved, it's done so through through icon, through image. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, early on when the young character – I guess we should say something about the premise. But at one point when the young uh, girl is calling out for her mother, in the word balloon, there is a picture of the mother's face – and an exclamation mark next to it. So we know she's calling out mother, mother, where are you or something to the effect without the words. Yeah. And so um, to, I guess, try to summarize the premise of this, um, the, uh, <laughs> as best as we can, the, the main, the main female character um, is uh, lives, lives, lives at home with her parents basically. And, and, um, until she's pretty old, continues to breastfeed. Uh, and then once her mother is no longer able to breastfeed her, she um, blindfolds the girl and sends her out into the world. And it is this fantastic world um, with uh, various creatures and locations that aren't based in reality. And um, And the girl goes through various traumatic experiences out in the world often with men um Mm -hmm. in these relation in these relationships she has um and and so it's a kind of episodic series of of these these adventures that she has with these different um interactions that she has with men and other creatures that she encounters in her travels Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You, you said a lot there, I think, in, in <laughs> summing up what is going on here. Um, and I guess we can call this woman, our protagonist, Canopy. I mean, I'm assuming that that's her name um, because the word canopy or anything relating to an actual canopy doesn't really appear in the book. So I don't know. I guess that's her name. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, I yeah. was one because I was wondering as that's another reason why I looked through the book a couple times was to kind of gauge a sense of what's the what's the title mean. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm not sure. Not yeah. entirely sure. Yeah, um, a couple things though that you mentioned during your your summing up is that that I want to focus on. You know, one is the the strange surreal element to this world mm-hmm. that the protagonist, if her name is Canopy, uh, that she inhabits. And at times it's dreamlike. Mm-hmm. And this whole dreamlike feel links up to the other point that I wanted to make uh, that uh, or emphasize that you made just a moment ago. And that is uh, Canopy, the, re- the protagonist's relationship with men. Mm-hmm. I think it would be really easy if you were psychodynamically prone mm. that you could do a lot with this book, especially when it comes to the young girl's relationship with her father. Mm. Because fairly early on, you mentioned that at the at the beginning, Canopy is with her mother and father, and she stays with the mother breastfeeding until she gets quite big. Well, before she gets that big, the father leaves, mm. or at least seems to leave – because we get in the opening panels, panels without you know borders really, um, the father there with the mother occupying himself while Canopy breastfeeds. Canopy continues to breastfeed, and you can see that the father is getting restless. At one point, the mother, as she's breastfeeding Canopy, looks over at the father right before he leaves as if to anticipate he's going to leave, he's not 
you know, something's changing. And then throughout the rest of the book, her father pops up every now and again in, I don't know how you call it, maybe dream sequences, because mm-hmm. there are moments where she seems to be asleep. And these are the pages in the book that have this orange background, because the book is 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 it's not just black and white i mean it, it's the orange is the prominent color throughout i would yeah you say orange it's it appears red to me but it may be i don't know what it looks like i don't have a print copy so you do so. yeah yeah well yeah yeah orange red i would say um because i do have a, a hard mm-hmm. copy of it um but in those sections where you have the orange red background and you see canopy with her father in a variety of different scenarios. And these seem to me, I mean, if they're dreamlike sequences and if they deal with father-daughter relationships, these are the, I guess, the most Freudian that that the story gets. Um, But you definitely don't have to see it through a Freudian lens. Mm -hmm. But there's obviously something going on there between father and daughter in how the father's presence or maybe even the lack thereof has really affected the way that Canopy sees herself in her world yeah yeah that that's true um and so um it's it's unclear whether she's trying in these male relationships to maybe fill in some um lack of of male presence in her life um but uh there definitely there's definitely a lot going on there and and i think with its wordlessness, with its um, kind of strange and fantastic setting, that um, I think it opens it up itself up to to an allegorical reading, right? Uh, and I, and for me, that happened early on when uh, when the protagonist comes across a I guess a farmer or a gardener who is basically growing <laughs> f- female body parts. Um, he's got one one row of his garden. Uh, grows, um, you know, uh, women's legs and skirt and a skirt. One grows um, the uh, breasts. Another grows a um, rear end and and finally a vagina. And mm-hmm. he, and he puts these pieces together and makes, I guess, a, a, a meal out of them and, and eats them. And this really disturbs the girl as she sees this and he chases after her and tries to eat her. But the, uh, the garden act with a knife, yeah, a phallic. Yeah. yeah. And the garden, the garden yeah. actually, uh, strikes back. And so, yeah. So, so seeing all that, I think opens itself up almost automatically to, um, look, looking for an allegorical reading, especially one that deals with, you know, gender relationships. Oh yeah, exactly. Now, in this scene that you just mentioned with uh, the gardener of uh, female parts, I mean, you know he's evil because he's got that dastardly thin mustache. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, but you know, another male relationship that we see in the book, and this is about halfway through, is with the faceless man who basically finds her after her mother abandons her in the forest. Right. Now, early on, when the mother does blindfold Canopy, again, if that's her name, and leaves her in the forest, there is this faceless male figure, although at the time we don't know that he's faceless, we don't see his face. The panel is basically Mm -hmm. cut off around where his neck is, and so we see him in that way, or we see him from behind. We see him take her by the hand as she's still blindfolded thinking that this is her mother and he leads her off into the woods or what looks like deeper into the forest and it's black where he's leading her so then you think something you know nefarious is going to be going on but then after that we really don't see this guy again until later on and this is what i find so fascinating and Speaking of reading things allegorically, it really opens things up here, is there seems to be a relationship between these two established of some sort, of a friendly sort at least, and his facelessness at first amuses the young girl, and and also the fact that he can change his face at will. So there's one scene where he's faceless, but then he transforms his face into that of, uh, I don't know, some kind of rodent or 
type animal, then a fish, then a bird, then an insect. And then Canopy really likes that. They become affectionate. They kiss. But when they kiss, he kisses her long and hard. At that point, her face transfers over to his, and she becomes faceless. And so here we get this consumption of identity uh, and her not having one at one point, so to speak. Again, if you read this allegorically, Mm -hmm. her chasing after him to regain that face that was once hers Mm -hmm. that now he has. So, I mean, I, I really liked where this was going. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot. I think each one of the many different relationships that she comes across um, highlights some other some other aspect of male female relationships. You know, there's the um, the flower that becomes basically completely dependent on her um, right. to survive. Um, you know, and all these other uh, the flautist, the flautist, the musician, the musician right? Um, so anyway, yeah, so. There's, and then and then even coming across her father again um mm-hmm. and so there's uh there's a lot of different uh ways i think of reading it i think uh it uh Bernadou does a great job of of creating a work that has this kind of space for interpretation in it and mm-hmm. um and i think it's a rich work and and again because it's because it's wordless, um, it, it I think opens it up self up to being read multiple times because you can read it at whatever pace kind of you you can look at the pictures. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to give anything away about the very end of this, but I do think it's worth mentioning that one of the things that uh Bernadou does is the last male figure that she gives us is of 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 a male who is represented as a wolf and so th- i mean you look at this and you immediately think of red riding hood and mm. all of the ramifications of men as wolves as carnivores as consumer uh, uh, consumer of 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 just you know <laughs> everything really mm. and the being this danger figure Bernadou doesn't take an easy and predictable route here, and I think that is what I really appreciate. I mean, that was that was the underscore of 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 this book for me. I mean, I liked where she was going before that, but that she didn't use illustrations in a way to, I guess, in a traditional manner of representing men as wolves. I, I really appreciated that. Um, but also another thing about the very ending of the book, it is extremely open. I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, and uh, I, I tend to enjoy those kind of endings anyhow. Sure, sure, yeah, I, and I think that adds to the, um, the you know the readerly quality of this this book as a whole. Um, mm. So yeah, I I did I did appreciate this work quite a bit. Um, like I said, I went through it multiple times and, um, you know, found it enriched by each uh, successive reading. I agree. Um, you know, we've, we've mentioned not only on this episode, but on previous ones as well, our love of uh, Retrofit Big Planet. And one of the reasons is that they have a great track record of introducing us to creators that we weren't familiar with previously, or if we were, maybe even marginally. Had you heard of uh, Corrine Bernadou before this? No, no, not at all. Yeah, I had neither. In fact, I think this is her first work translated into English. Uh, I did a search of her work on, let's say, on Amazon, and the only thing I could find was that she was an illustrator in a book that came out a few years ago called Story of the Art Sticker Book. Um, but her own work, and you can, she does have a a blog you can check out references to her other work but you know she's a french cartoonist and illustrator and i do think that this is the first work of hers that has been translated which is strange because it's wordless Mm -hmm. um so you could read the original french but by saying it's translated i mean that it's one that is printed for an english audience Mm -hmm. english-speaking audience
So we're at the last title that we're going to be discussing this week, and this is Richard Corbin's Shadows on the Grave coming out from Dark Horse Comics. And the second issue of this miniseries was released a couple of weeks ago on January 11th. Yes. Yes. It's not often that we discuss Richard Corbin on the Comics Alternative, although he comes up occasionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we have – we when he was doing that series or the new series of Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, um, we referenced him – or I know I referenced him quite a number of times. We've discussed at least one of those adaptations on a Halloween show, and I don't think you were a part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Gene and I talked on another Halloween show about – the the larger collection that came out a few years ago of those Poe stories. And then I think it was Wolverton and I discussed issue number one of Rat God from a mm-hmm. couple of years ago. So this may be the first time you and I are discussing Richard Corbin together outside of just a passing reference in a preview show. Yeah, I decided to finally give in and let you have your Richard Corbin <laughs> uh, on a regu- on a regular show, I didn't have really any alternative to to include uh, and include here. But you know, um, because w- when we've mentioned him on say preview shows, he's one of those creators that I I kind of uh, you know that that we divide on. I guess you know there's there's a handful of those, mm-hmm. and you know this is probably unpopular for me because I know you know Richard Corbin is a widely respected and renowned artist especially in horror comics and I really do I really do appreciate his art and um and marvel at it uh at, by looking at it but um but he's also he's also a very very disturbing horror comics creator mhm uh, and I think that's really on display here in Shadows of the Grave or shadows on the grave. Excuse me. Yeah. Now, is the disturbing aspect of his art what not repels you, but doesn't bring you to Corbin comics? Yeah, I don't know. You know, when I was reading this, I was I was trying to think back to my own experience with Corbin, and I feel like I have like a vague memory from childhood. I know I know that when I was when I was pretty young like 6 or 7 years old I had a barber uh that I went to who had a stack of Warren comics um in the barber shop and those I would pour through while I was waiting for uh my turn to get a haircut and or then waiting for my brother to get his haircut and um and that's where I was first exposed, for example, to the spirit. And I have really, really distinct memories of reading uh, Warren Spirit magazines uh, at, at that place. But I, I have less distinct memories of having seen Corbin stuff in, in some of those Warren magazines. But I feel like I did and was so kind of disturbed by it, like the, you know, <laughs> by the like kind of bald creatures with big eyes or whatever the kind of grotesque monsters and so on and people that he drew that it had it had such a it had like a kind of um you know it it buried itself it dug itself into my psyche and and had this kind of traumatic impact to the point that when i look at his his work now with the exception of maybe something like his bail or excuse me his uh hellboy stuff um that it recalls whatever that you know that kind of primal experience was when I was a when I was a little kid, if mm-hmm. that makes if that makes any sense. And so um, you know I had never I had, at that point I had been reading comics but had never seen anything like that, and um, it was probably too soon for me to have seen that. Yeah, I know. Earlier we were just talking about uh, a psychological reading of Canopy, and now we can talk about a psychological reading of Andy reading <laughs> Richard Corbin. Right, and you know, and then on top of that, then I probably saw the heavy metal movie too early in my life, in my childhood too. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that. That's got a, a section. Oh of yeah, R- Richard Corbin's Den in it, and Shadows on the Grave also. Um, 
has a serialized short shorter stories here from that fit into the den universe with with is it den's son Danaeus? yeah i uh, uh i think so yeah or the grand nephew of den yeah 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 so we're we're still a distant grand nephew yeah we're still in the den universe yeah um you know you mentioned the disturbing quality of corbin's art yeah i mean even when he is depicting a scene where it's not necessarily horrific or disturbing on the surface. He just, he creates a disturbance within normal existence in the way that he illustrates. And you were talking about the, the way that he draws eyes. And I, and I agree. Another thing that always has struck me about Corbin, especially in his more recent, let's say over the past 10 years Mm -hmm. work is the way that he draws teeth, mouths and teeth to me, Corbin mouths and Corbin teeth, much, much more disturbing than Corbin eyes. And I know that Corbin has adapted twice um, Edgar Allan Poe's short story, uh, Berenice, but which has everything to do with teeth and teeth obsession mm. in a weird, wacky way. Um, but I think that Corbin's obsession, if we want to call it that, with teeth, the way that he represents in a disturbing way uh, human mouths and teeth runs throughout his comics, not just the Edgar Allan Poe stuff, uh, but 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 everything. Uh, and this struck home in the very first issue of um, Shadows on the Grave, where we get to this first story and, oh, this is called uh, uh, Strung Along. And this is a story where the these two kids out in the country come upon, or it's after hours out outside of a, a puppeteer's truck, right? Because mm-hmm. they just saw during the day the, uh, the the a puppet show, and so the kids sneak up on the truck at night uh, after everybody's gone, and they see the creatures that they had thought were puppets. Now these creatures are disturbing enough as it is outside of the eyes and mouth and specifically Mm -hmm. the teeth but it's the eyes and especially the teeth that gives me the willies no matter how and i've I've read this first issue multiple times i'm looking at it right now again i'm getting the willies again i it it is it is freaky yeah those creatures that are the that are but we find out are the puppets Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that they're that's awful and then, and they don't speak. <laughs> they, they they speak in this this shrill. Re re re. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, and it, that's it, spooky too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, then that starts off the first issue, and from there on, I was like, oh my god, what are, what are we doing? Um, <laughs> that, that is that is really genuinely a, a genuinely upsetting thing, and you know it's. It's not only for me too. It's not only the the eye. I I I do get what you're saying about the teeth. The eyes are disturbing. Noses are disturbing, and in some cases, in many cases, the lack of eyes yeah. also freaks me out. Well, let's um, just say about everything, <laughs> yeah, yeah. illustration wise, is disturbing mm-hmm. about Corbin here. But there's there's also in some of in some of his work, and this this may just be be me, but. Uh, I got this in the Danaeus story um, in particular, but in in others, is that there's um, there's a real sense, a, a genuine sense of the uncanny in the, the sense that I, I feel like there's something I'm not quite getting about the story that I don't, I don't quite have enough information or I don't know or, or, better yet maybe don't want to know anymore like i don't really want to push my thinking about the story any further than the surface otherwise um i'm going to get into uncomfortable territory now you're talking specifically about the uh Denea story or just all the stories in the first two issues i think so i think it's an it's in in many of the stories it, it comes it came across to me most i think in the Denea story which may just be because i'm not I'm not all entirely familiar familiar with that, but even in in some of these other some of these other stories, like um, in the again in the first issue, um, for better or worse, mm-hmm. um, 
we really don't get a lot of answers as to what has exactly happened to this husband, this woman's abusive husband. Um, right. But it is, uh, um, and so and so when it ends, it just ends on this mystery. Right. And I'm glad that you have mentioned this because I, I think that this is a way of describing not only the stories in this series, Shadows on the Grave, but I think it also could describe some of other Corbin's work we've seen over the past several years. These – okay, so – the first two issues of Shadows of the Grave that we've gotten so far, and I'm assuming that the next six issues, because this is uh, an eight issue series, um, are going to be each is each of the following issues is going to be the same. So basically, we have an issue divided into four stories, four sections, each of which is about eight pages long. Mm-hmm. So with each of these stories, and with the first two issues, we do get the last story being this Danaeus. And so this is going to, I don't know if it's going to be ongoing among all eight issues or not, um, but that's the longer story of everything in these issues we've seen so far. The other story is about eight pages long. There's not enough room for Corbin, who not only illustrates this, but writes it as well. Uh, Ragamore is something that he did a few years ago where he illustrated, but he wasn't the writer. Which, But that has a very similar feel to this. But this, he is the writer and illustrator. Eight pages is not enough for him to write an in-depth short work, a horror work or a mm-hmm. macabre work. And so there's some of these where I get a sense that he's just scratching the surface, as you suggested, and we don't get much more information about what's going on underneath. So, for instance, as you pointed out, the husband in For Better or Worse. Mm-hmm. Um so if you're looking for the kind of weird, strange stories that you may get, let's say, on a Twilight Zone episode, which, you know, you could say that in some ways this has the Twilight Zone mm-hmm. spirit but doesn't go into the depth of what you get in something like a Twilight Zone episode or an Edgar Allan Poe or Lovecraft story. It's almost as if with each brief look at the situation and these characters – with the short stories, we just see a little bit. We see it askance. We don't see too deep. Maybe because if we did see it too deep, um, we wouldn't be the same. Right, right. Um, you know, you mentioned the comparison to the Twilight Zone, and definitely has that anthology feel. I do think, though, this is this is also a a callback to stuff like you know the Warren creepy and eerie magazines, right. which themselves are you know, callbacks to the old EC comics and stuff like that. But, um, you know, taking on a more graphic and disturbing quality that, you know, wouldn't have, wouldn't have floated in the comics code era anywhere else, but in creepy and eerie. Um, yeah. One, you know, one of the other stories that had the uncanny feeling to me is the, the thing in the swamp, which is in the second issue. Um, at some point in that story, I, I, you know, I couldn't even, you know, we, this, whatever this thing is in the house that is causing, uh, the, these men to, um, you know, lose their minds and die or whatever. We never see. It's always just in shadow. We only get hints at, at something that is unworldly and, um, and we don't know what happened. (laughs) <laughs> with it with it and i don't i don't know if it's a sense that that corbin's not having enough space but he's really using the eight page that eight page short story in a really effective way to create this ambiguous horror um, right that he that he does again that he does so well mm-hmm. yeah and it, again underscore the ambiguous part because i agree with you in that these stories are in many ways a reminder of the kind of things that we used to get in the old creepy and eerie and then before that the ec comics but even in those short bits right they're Mm -hmm. about the same page length i come away from reading those stories thinking that i know more about what went on i don't feel at a loss to try to understand Mm -hmm. motivation or you know what certain creatures are. So you mentioned uh, the, the story in the second issue about the swamp. Um, I mean, there's a lot unanswered in this story, right. and 
I mean, I think that's the kind of writer that Corbin is. I don't think that that's a, uh, a a weak point. I think that's just his style. And there's something I, I could see someone coming away from many of these stories, if not most, thinking, "Well, he started off good, but there's just not enough depth there." I think the lack of depth and explanation, or as you put it, the ambiguity, is all a part of what defines Corbin. In, in the horror genre specifically. So, you know, readers who may be new to Richard Corbin, if they're if they're coming to it expecting tighter stories where there are few questions left outside of like, you know, whatever horror twist that we get at the very end, um, they may be a little disappointed. Uh, but I do think that this is part of the Corbin style of this mm-hmm. kind of uh, almost Passover kind of storytelling. I don't know if that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I like I like that way of, of that way of describing it, and so um, you know I think not not a lot of not a lot of creators. Well, I mean, not a lot of creators have had the the career and longevity of of Richard Corbin, but not a lot of creators are doing this sort of work right now uh, in terms of these kind of old old school classic horror comics. Down, down mm-hmm. to having a you know a narrator. We haven't mentioned Mag the Hag, uh, who is the uh, who's the host for these for these issues. Um, all that again recalls um, EC and 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 uh, Warren magazines. So um, yeah, so the this for for people who've you know either not ex- not experienced that as a major part of comics as it was in the in the really the 50s and again in the 70s or if they're familiar with that and looking looking for that to return again we have that in this this series oh exactly and i'm glad that you mentioned the hosts that we have in this the first two issues and i'm assuming it's going to be the same uh, throughout um because that's something else that i consider a defining quality of corbin Mm -hmm. in his horror um, you mentioned ha- Mag the Hag, but there's a second narrator, and he's the one who's doing the the Danius stories. And this is Gergi Tate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, now I was familiar with Mag the Hag, but not with Gergi Tate. But I looked up Gergi Tate. This is an older narrator host of his, but someone from what I gathered, Corbin hasn't used in years. Um, and I think that's why we get in this first issue of a reference to Gergi Tate coming back uh, and being used again that, you know, you thought that he may have been gone, but here he is again. Uh, Mag the Hag, from everything that I've gathered, is a fairly recent phenomenon. Now, when it comes to Corbin's adaptation work on Edgar Allan Poe, they're basically – well, he's been doing it for most of his career, period. Um, but there were – two books on Poe adaptations that were generated from miniseries. Um, there was one that came out a number of years ago from Marvel. Um, uh, what was it? I think um, Edgar Allan Poe's Haunt of Horror, yeah, I think is yeah. what it was called. And that was a three-issue miniseries that were later collected in in book form that were really good. And then there were the more recent series through dark horse that corbin would sometimes I mean, more times than not these were single issues but they weren't part of a mini series right so it's not like corbin's new poe issue one um corbin's new poe issue two these were again for the most part single issues but with one or two titles and one i believe was follow the house of usher that was a two issue adaptation but he later then collected these into Spirits of the Dead, which came out a little more than two years ago. Now, in both cases, he uses host narrators. In the Marvel Haunt of Horror, it was a character named Uncle Dedger, and <laughs> he had the Edgar Allan Poe mustache. But Mag the Hag makes, I think, her first appearance in the more recent – Poe adaptations that Corbin started to do with Dark Horse several years back. I don't th- now if there is a Corbin scholar out there or aficionado who knows of instances of Mag the Hag before then, please email us and let me know. But I think that Mag the Hag began with 
the more recent Poe adaptations. But then we see Mag the Hag in other Corbin comics. I know, did you ever read Rat God? No. Okay, she makes an appearance in Rat God, in Rat God as well. Occasionally, not as a steady, ongoing host, but she's nonetheless there. So I found it interesting that she's back now as a full-fledged host along with Gurgi Tate because it reminds us of this older style of horror comics that we saw, you know, obviously with EC, but also with other horror comics of the 50s as well. You know, many of them have their hosts. Um, but then we saw it later with uh, the Warren stuff, and then with DC horror comics in the '70s with Cain, Abel, and Eve. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, and, and and I love that kind of hosting. Yeah, that that's fun, especially when you know. I, I I'm glad you reminded me of Cain, Abel, and Eve and the D, the DC ones because I, I always felt those were really fun, especially the relationship between Cain and Abel. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so this is a long tradition, I guess, in, in horror comics that uh, Corbin is returning, returning to and has returned to over and over again in his career, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this is really good. Also, uh, we should note that uh, unlike the last few things that Corbin has done at Dark Horse, this one is in black and white. Uh, and we mentioned Mag the Hag at the very beginning of this first issue. I found it interesting that she explains that this is in black and white and gray tones. Yeah. She, she says, you may have noticed that the stories here are rendered in black, white, and gray tones. This is not because we are cheap, we are, or poor, we are. Mm-hmm. The reason is that images in gray tones create and express a special unity and mood, which is most appropriate for short horror comics. And this is great. I really, really like that. Now, the Poe, the more recent Poe adaptations that make up Spirits of the Dead, those were in color. Uh, and then... Uh, Rat God, which I think was a five-issue miniseries and then collected, that was in color. It's good to see Corbin returning to the gray tones here. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know that is, that is part of his his style that to me is so so amazing, and and also adds to the um, really uncanny quality to it because there's there's this smoothness to it that makes it seem almost like it's not drawn if that makes any Mm -hmm. sense and that uh, i think that makes it is makes it disturbing to me as well right the semi-photographic nature of some of these illustrations yeah yeah so um might this be a way for us to introduce more corbin in future episodes probably not (laughs) (laughs) we'll see Okay, so at least we got some Corbin in on this week's episode, Uh, but we had a full plate. We started with Beowulf, the latest comics adaptation by Santiago Garcia and David Rubin. Then we looked at a new title from Retrofed Big Planet Comics, Canopy, by Karen Bernadou. And then we wrapped up with Richard Corbin's Shadows on the Grave. The first two issues of that are already out. So very different comics, but uh, all fun. Yep. Yes. And if you want to check out great comics like the ones that we discussed on this week's episode, then definitely check out our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com, and there you're going to find loads O discounts. And after you do pre-order your comics there get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading if you go to our website comicsalternative.com you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via speakpipe which is really easy to use or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 415-3-COMICS that's 415-326-6427 that's right. Uh, or you can get a hold of us by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com. We also have individual email addresses. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. Also, check out our Twitter feed, which is at the number two guys with PhDs. 
That's right. And you can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube, among other places. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can always find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is, again, comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, find out what we're doing, and let us know how we're doing. And we do like to hear from you, so please do contact us. Until next week, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.